Hello and welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. This is your host, Anthony, and with me is my co-host, Greg. In these episodes, our goal is to challenge and encourage you to dig deeper into God's Word. Hello, everyone. This is Greg. I'm glad you're with us today. So, Greg, what do we have for today? Well, Anthony, I thought we'd talk about the kingdom of heaven. To be more specific, does the kingdom of heaven differ from the kingdom of God? And should we understand it to be the kingdom in heaven? Yeah, I know there may be some confusion out there about this. If I remember correctly, only the gospel according to Matthew in the New Testament uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. All the other gospel accounts use the phrase kingdom of God. That's absolutely right. So, Greg, why is that? Is there a difference? Or do these two phrases mean the same thing? In a nutshell, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God mean exactly the same thing. This interchangeable use of words likely comes from the words of the prophet Daniel at Daniel 2 verse 44, which says, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. As this speaks of a kingdom established by God, who incidentally is in heaven, in the Jewish mind, the term kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God would mean the same thing. So let me clarify. Kingdom of heaven does not mean the kingdom is literally in heaven, does it? It's a kingdom that is to be on the planet Earth. Indeed, Anthony. Daniel chapter 2 talks about just such a kingdom being established on the earth. In this prophecy, a divided kingdom that's in place at the Messiah's return will be utterly destroyed, making place for a new kingdom to be ruled over by the Messiah. These Old Testament prophecies are at the very heart of everything the New Testament writers wrote of concerning future events. Daniel had a lot to say about this future kingdom. Daniel 7.27 describes it this way, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So his kingdom seems to include all places of the earth, and no nation or people will be excluded, totally worldwide. That's definitely the picture we get from the Old Testament, Anthony. Daniel clearly teaches that this kingdom belongs to God, who resides in heaven. This is why kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are so interchangeable. But it's not a kingdom in heaven, as Daniel obviously describes it as being on the earth. As I think about this, a few modern sayings come to mind. Heaven help me and heaven knows are phrases used by many today. Most of us realize what's really being said is God help me and God knows. So it's not such a foreign idea to use God and heaven interchangeably, is it? No, it's really not. Interestingly, even today, religious Judaism shies away from using the words God or Lord. Instead, they'll say the Almighty, the one above, or they'll use the Hebrew word Hashem, meaning the name. In modern Jewish writings, when the word God is used, frequently a dash will be used to replace the O in God, so it will be spelled G-D instead of G-O-D. This comes from a very strong, albeit incorrect, belief that one should not use any divine name, whether it be God, Lord, or a pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton, the four Hebrew letters that spell God's proper name. We would pronounce these as Jehovah or Yahweh. We even see in most of our English translations the word Lord in all capital letters as a substitution for God's proper name in the Old Testament. Again, this all stems from the belief that no divine name should be vocalized except when, for example, reading directly from the Torah. This aversion to using any divine name comes from the commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, doesn't it? And it's not a new practice. The correct pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton, God's proper name, was essentially lost around 2,500 years ago because the Jews at the time feared 
by using it, people would get too complacent and use it improperly or in vain. Over the years, not only did they never pronounce God's proper name, but they began to abstain from saying God or Lord. That's right. Although we can only speculate, it's very likely that in Jesus' day, the Jews had begun to avoid using the word God. Perhaps not completely, but they likely used it sparingly. So, Greg, we know the Gospel according to Matthew was primarily written for a Jewish audience. The Gospel of Mark was likely written for more of a Gentile audience, and Luke definitely was written for a Gentile audience, as, in the beginning, he addresses the man to whom he wrote it for as the Most Excellent Theophilus. The title, Most Excellent, is a title used for governmental officials, and it was very likely Theophilus was some kind of Roman official. When we understand that the Jews were likely very cautious about using divine names, we may be better able to understand why Matthew may have used the phrase kingdom of heaven rather than kingdom of God. Matthew was just accommodating his future readers. Absolutely. And this wouldn't be wrong to do, really. After all, the Old Testament identifies God with heaven. At Isaiah 66, 1, God says, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Jesus quotes this verse when he commands against swearing or making oaths. At Matthew 5, 24, he said, But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Heaven and God are identified as being synonymous. I can think of a few ways we do this, even today. For example, we may say the White House when referring to the President of the United States. For example, the White House today vetoed such and such a bill. Because the location is so unique and inseparable from who resides at that location, by stating the location, everyone knows who you're talking about. Exactly. Example after example in the Bible shows us this kingdom will be on earth. A quick reference to Psalm chapter 2, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, Daniel chapter 7, which we referenced earlier, and Zechariah chapter 14 will all show how unanimous were the Old Testament prophets in telling us this kingdom will be on the earth, not in heaven. A phrase our audience may have come across when reading the Bible is throne of David. In the Old Testament, this throne was promised to David's son, who would be the Messiah. Isaiah 16 verse 5 prophesied, In mercy the throne will be established, and one will sit on it in truth, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice, and hastening righteousness. The New Testament confirms, This is Jesus the Messiah. At Luke 1 verses 32 and 33, the angel Gabriel announced to Mary about him, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now we all know David never reigned in heaven. His throne was right here on earth. Greg, some may quote Paul's words at 2 Timothy 4.18, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever, and think this means a kingdom in heaven. What do you say to that? James wrote that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. James 1.17 Anything and everything we can think of as being good comes from heaven, because that's where God is. Paul wrote at Philippians 3.20 and 21, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which he's able to even subdue all things to himself. Our citizenship is in heaven, because that's where God and Jesus are currently. But as you'll notice here, we await the Saviour's return to us. We don't go to him, he comes to us. Yeah, well, that agrees perfectly with Titus 2.13 that talks about the blessed hope being the glorious appearing of Jesus. When he ascended into heaven, 
as his disciples stood gaping after him. The angels told them he would return in like manner as they saw him leave. Acts 1.11 And at Revelation 1.7 we're told, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. As you said, we await his return to the earth. Precisely. Well, thanks, Greg. I hope this was helpful to our audience. I'm sure this hasn't been an exhaustive exploration of this topic, but hopefully this was enough to get those listening interested to search deeper. That's always the goal. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to Iron Sharpens Iron. I'm Anthony, and my co-host has been Greg. Tune in again for more topics where we aim to challenge and encourage you to dig deeper into God's Word. Have a blessed day. Thank you.